Good afternoon, students. I've been getting a couple questions on your next milestone, the one dealing with authentication. So I thought I'd take a, a moment and record another video, kind of like we did last week, to talk you through uh, what we're actually looking at there and what our expectations for that are. <clears throat> So before we dive too deep, let's go back and let's review the authentication process and how uh, we actually can get that working in our applications. So very quickly, we're building a web app. It has a database, and in that database, we have user records. So we have one, two, three users here, Amy. Ryan and Carol. And they are all stored, or their user information will be stored here in the database. So and we have them all in a user table. And what are we storing in that user table? Well, probably an email, a cryptid password. And that is very important. It needs to be encrypted. It should never, ever, ever, ever ever under any circumstances be stored as plain text in your database. If you do that, there's no hope for you. You cannot store plain text passwords. That is the worst security idea you could possibly do. Okay, uh, and then we're in this requirement, we're also gonna store their first and last names. So that's the contents of the table. We have a unique table entry for Amy, one for Brian, one for Carol. We have our web app, which talks to that database. So our database uh, and web app have a nice two-way connection, and they are communicating with each other. Now let's say Amy wants to access our website, so she logs in, she requests a page. Our web app does not know who Amy is, so our response would normally be send back the sign-in form. So we ask, prompt them for a sign-in form, we ask them for the password and for the uh, username that they want to log in with, in this case her email address, so what's your email, your password, and she logs in by entering that information. This connection, just to be clear, should be HTTPS. Now in our case, we're actually getting that secure connection through the proxy server that sits between our web app and Amy. There's technically another web server that uh, handles the actual connection, and that web server is Codio's web server, and it sits right between this request. So as a proxy server, what happens is Amy will request against the Codio box, the Codio Box will pass that on to our web app. Our web app will send a response. That proxy server will continue to send on that response. Now, a proxy server can manipulate the request because it sits right between them. And that's exactly what this proxy server does. The Codio proxy server specifically uh, adds cookie information specific to the Codio login so that when you click the box URL, you can access pages that are being served by your web app, but the outside world can't because they haven't been authenticated against Codio. So this chunk is actually served through HTTPS, and this part is served just through HTTP. There's no need to secure it because this is all internal to your Codio box. The server's running there and your web app's serving there. That's also why we're not running our web apps on port 80 or port 443, which is the standard for HTML or CSS, because that's actually being done here by the proxy server. And the proxy server is using those ports where we can't actually access them because they're already in use. So we run it on a different port that this proxy server is listening to, and it passes our requests on for us. So that's the, the real kind of setup that we have here. But if we were considering this as a traditional web app, this would all obviously be connected directly to our web app and would be going over HTTPS. Okay, so we prompt for the login, they log in, we go back to the server, the server says, okay, you're logged in, here's what you requested and sends it back. Now, the next time Amy makes a request against the web server, the web server doesn't know who Amy is. 
because this request is not logged in. She was for the first request, not for any subsequent requests, because remember, HTTP is a stateless protocol. It doesn't keep track of individual users. So for our web app, it says, oh, you're not logged in. Here's a sign-in form. Please sign in. Then it'll let you access your resource. Now, obviously, if you do this in a real life scenario, you're going to have a lot of very upset customers because nobody wants to have to sign in every single time they request the next page or the next item from this web server. In fact, if you think about it, when we logged in uh, with our, or when we make a request, an HTTP request for a page, we get back the HTML, we parse that HTML, our browser needs to make additional requests for additional resources like this JavaScript file, the CSS file, all those files. If, bear with me, if we're not keeping that user logged in, we have to request it again and again and again and again. Now, HTTP basic auth dealt with that by actually sending some authentication information directly in the headers with the requests. And the browser held on to that information and kept resending. The problem is HTTP auth is not very secure by modern standards. It's not a good protocol to use in the real world. So we're not going to use HTTP basic authentication. I introduce it just so you can see it, so you know what it is. We're not using that. Uh, what we want to do is we want to actually log in and stay logged in. And that means we have to have cookies. Cookies bring state to HTTP. Without cookies, we have no state. Without cookies, every time we make a request, we're making a brand new request as though we're somebody the server has never seen. Now, even with cookies, we're still somebody the server has never seen every time we make a request. The difference is uh, when we log in, so when the server says you are now logged in, it sends a set cookie header with the response coming back. So now we set the cookie. Uh, that means we have a session cookie here on Amy's laptop. And let me make this smaller. This is way too big for this demo. Uh, yeah. So Amy now has a session cookie. And every time Amy's computer now makes a request against our web server, this session cookie gets sent back to the web server and it gets sent on a cookie header. So these are headers in the header protocol, uh, cookie, colon, and whatever the cookie value is, and set cookie. So if that kind of clarifies things, the cookie itself is nothing more than text. It's just a short text file uh, that we take the contents and we set it as the cookie header and send it back. Uh, so what could that cookie be? Well, we could uh, make it be something like, uh, let's see, we're identifying Amy, so let's make it Amy. And her last name, Amy Bretz, and uh, that's our user. So every time we ask you who you are, well, that cookie says, oh, I'm Amy Bretz. Now we know who it is. We can look them up in the database. Oh, we need their database ID too. So she is the first user in our database. So her ID is one. So we can parse that information out nice and handy. We've got everything we need. Bam, we're good, right? except that cookie is stored here on the computer. Let's say Amy logged in from a public computer and uh, Zach comes by later. Zach gets in, looks at the cookie information, says, oh, here's in plain text, the cookie information for this web app. And there's a, a user ID. I, I can just resend this cookie and I'm now logged in as Amy Bryce. Not a great idea. So we don't want to send plain text information here. What we actually do is we encrypt this. We want to make sure these sessions are encrypted and that makes them look like gibberish. Now we encrypt them with uh, a cryptographic function using a secret that we only know on the server. So on the server side, we can decrypt that and make sense of it. So we could go ahead and store Amy's information that way. If we do that, that is what is called a session a cookie session. So the, the actual full session information, everything we need to know about Amy is stored in the cookie.
Now, clearly there's some risk to that. You're actually putting a lot of information out on a computer that potentially could be compromised and somebody could get a hold of that cookie. They could spend some serious time trying to crack the encryption on it. And they might be able to figure out exactly what that cookie says. Uh, the other approach we can use is instead of storing all that information in an encrypted form, we can store some unique information and keep most of the session information back here on the server. And there's two approaches for that. There is the in-memory session. And an in-memory session just means that it is stored here in our web app in RAM. So we have something like a sessions array. And for each user, we create a unique session when they log in. So Amy has her own session uh, specific to, this is important, this computer. So when she logs in, there's a session that is equated to this computer uh, and has a unique identifier. That unique identifier is actually what we put in our sessions cookie. So if this is the encrypted version, uh, it might be um, something like, and usually we won't do numbers that are incremented. We'll use something like a UUID, so a generated random uh, string, which is usually going to be in hexadecimal. So it might have uh, a couple letters in it, everything from A through F, and it's going to be uh, like a 64-bit long string or something, and that's going to represent our unique identifier. So in this case, if this is hers, that means in the sessions we have a sessions entry that corresponds to her session and that holds all the information we need to know about Amy. So her, her first and last name and then anything else we're keeping track of in our session. So like if this is a shopping app and she's putting stuff in her shopping cart, that would go in the session. Make sense with me so far? Uh, so that's kind of one way of doing it. The other way we can do it is we can do uh, a in database session or a database session. In that case, we create another table in our database specific to hold sessions. And what we actually use as our session cookie here would be the ID of that session. So say the session was uh, 56, then we would store 56. And that would really all we really needed to store was the actual identity of the session. And we go ahead and access that from the database by doing a SQL select statement pull the rest of the session data out of the database, we load that up in memory. So we have to have a cookie for all three of these strategies. What differs is what we store in the cookie. With a cookie session, we store all the session information directly in the cookie. With an in-memory database, we store only the ID of the session, and then the session has all the unique information in memory of the web app. So that's actually just stored in a variable. Like we said, the sessions array. And that means when you stop and restart your web server, the sessions are all flushed because you're not holding on to them persistently, uh, which is normally fine for sessions because we don't necessarily need to keep them around for a long time. Or we can put them in the database table, which does persist them for as long as we want them. And the other thing we'll usually do with sessions is we'll have them expire after a certain duration. So after an hour, it's no longer a good session, you have to log back in. And how long that duration is really depends on your application, how secure you need to keep it, uh, what kind of information you're actually storing. Now the other thing that I do want to emphasize here is regardless of how we're storing those sessions, the session information is unique. Uh, to the connection. So that means if Carol logs in from this PC, then we have established a session that is unique to that PC. If she picks up her tablet and tries to access information, guess what? She is not authenticated, so she has to go through the authentication process again. And these are two completely different sessions, even though they are for the same user. And that's very important. But Every time you log in, you get in a different session. Every device you use, there's a different session because uh, the cookie itself is stored on the device. So when she logs in and gets her session cookie uh, on this first device, 
it doesn't exist on the second device. So she has to go ahead and make another login attempt uh, from the other device to get a new session cookie. Remember that cookie is set with the set cookie, and you only have to set it once. And after that, forever, after that, anytime the browser makes a request against your specific web app based on its domain, you're going to resend that cookie in the cookie header. So, what does that mean? How do we get the cookie information here in our web app? Well, let's move our database out of the way. Oops, let's grab the actual database. There's a whole lot of database stuff there. There we go. All right. So let's talk about the structure of our program. We have that request coming in. And the first thing we're going to process that request through is our router, which in our case is app the app file, because that's where we set it up. And we want to go ahead and pull the cookie data out. Well, you need some kind of middleware to do that. We wrote in one of our exercises a parse cookie middleware, and its whole job was to pull out the information from the cookie, that session cookie, and turn it into an object and attach it to the request object. So parse cookie, of course, takes a request and response. And if it's middleware, we also have the next function, some folk when we're done. So that's going to take our cookie from the uh, Our router needs to pass it through parse cookie uh, to get that information back out. Now, once we have that, the next thing we need to do is retrieve our session. And that's going to be dependent on how we've done sessions. So if we're doing a session cookie, then the cookie itself is the session. So our parse cookie can directly attach the session to the uh, request and you've got your session. Uh, if you're doing a in-memory session, then you're going to have to load the session out of memory using the ID held in the session cookie. So in that case, you'd have another piece of middleware, uh, which is maybe load session, something like that. And again, it's going to look something like this, uh, where we have the request the response object in our next. And then we can go ahead and load the session information from the in-memory store. Or if we're using a database cookie, we still need a load session middleware. The difference is now it talks directly to the database, uh, requests or uses a git uh, select statement with a where clause where the where identifies what session we're retrieving and pulls that information out. The other thing your load session middleware should be doing is checking for an expired session if you're expiring sessions. That makes sure that nobody can come back and access the page after somebody has left if they didn't log out. Now, that's a good question. What happens when you log out? One of the things you should do is send back a response that includes a set cookie header again. It's going to set the session cookie to an empty string, which effectively deletes it, either an empty string or null or undefined. We want to get rid of that cookie so that it's not held in memory, so that uh, or held in the, the cookies, so the next person to visit our website from that public computer can't access the previous person's logged in session. Uh, so those are kind of, this is kind of the pieces you need. Now, if we want to have the session loaded, any page that we visit, any route we go to, then this middleware actually needs to be run in the router for everything. And the easiest way of doing that is you can say app.use, which means it's going to be used before every request, with every request, uh, load uh, or actually parse cookie, and then we can do app.use load session. So if you pull those both in, you do those before you define your gets and your posts, then all those gets and posts, they will have the session data available to them that you have loaded from the cookie and or in-memory sessions or database sessions so that you can have that information and render it on your page, render that they're logged in, they're not logged in, uh, all of that kind of information. Uh, of course, you want to check to make sure they actually are logged in. Uh, if they're not logged in, then you're going to display a slightly different page where you suggest that they're logged in. But you have to have these pieces. You've got to have a cookie, and that cookie should be encrypted. That's best practices. We don't want to store plain text cookies, just like we don't want to store uh, plain text uh, passwords. So 
let's go back and take a quick look at our requirements for this particular assignment. So add a user table to store the user first and last names, encrypted password. This should also have the uh, email. We're going to need that as well. Email, first and last names, and encrypted password. Create the routes for signing up a new, as a new user. They need to provide their email, first and last names, and password when they are provided and do not conflict with one already in the database, we can add them to the database. You need to add password-based authentication. Implement user sessions. I'm not telling you how you do your sessions. You can use the in-memory, you can use the database, or you can use the cookie sessions. And create endpoints for logging in and out of the application when the users log in and phone which is that in the database. In other words, once they've logged in and you create that session, you need to set Use the set cookie header to send that back to the user so that they stay logged in. Uh, edit the website so it's clear when a user is logged in and when they're not, give them a link to the login page we create for requirement three. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of websites, they'll have up here who's logged in or a link to the login page as a navigation bar. If you want to do that, that's a great way of doing it. Uh, you can do that with a HTML template partial. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, or you can just manually do it on every page. If you do it in a partial, you only have to write the partial once and you can reuse it. Uh, but notice that if you're going to do that on every page, that means that session data has to be available on every page as well as, uh, so you have to have that session on every page. Hence, again, use middleware, use the use statement to make sure that that's available to you. Uh, need to alter your request table to retain a foreign key to the user who created the requests. So we want to keep track of who's making a request. Uh, to alter that table, SQLite 3, it's just a uh, alter table query. And if you haven't had the database course yet, you can kind of look it up. But basically, uh, you say alter table, and the name of the table, you can skip the schema name. That's why this arrow goes over the top. Uh, since we only have one database, we don't need to worry about schema. We're not going to rename, so it's not this one, not this one. It's this one right here. Add column, the name of the column, the type of the column. Column def is just the column name, what its type is, any constraints it has. Uh, and then we're going to add a foreign key, which is actually that constraint, which would be uh, the uh, foreign key and then references, users, and in parentheses, ID. So it's a fairly straightforward query. Uh, if you have trouble with it, let me know. But uh, I think you guys can figure it out. Uh, edit the box page of the form for submitting request only appears if the user is logged in. So now we're going to make sure that only shows up when they're logged in. If they're not logged in, have a link there saying, hey, want to make a request? Sign in. Uh, and that's going to take them to that sign-in page. And then once they submit a request, save it in the database using that ID. So I'll refactor so that you're also saving the user ID. Uh, by the way, that may mean that you want to clear out all the requests you currently have that don't have user IDs. Uh, a SQL statement that will do that is uh, delete star from requests, if that's the name of your table. Actually, I think it's just delete from table. I think that'll get rid of it. Uh, um, that's really it. We're just adding the authentication piece. So uh, go back, go through your auth tutorials. Uh, we are not doing basic authentication, so don't look at that one for more guidance. Look at the ones where we're doing password auth. Walk through those again, uh, and you can basically figure out from there exactly what you need to do. All right, that is our update. And good luck. We'll see you soon, I'm sure.